Welcome back, Oklahoma. It's 912. So each month here on KOCO, we sit down with our city's leaders to get the questions that you want answered answered. So here with us today, we've got Oklahoma City Police Chief Wade Gorley. Chief Gorley, welcome in. Always great to see you. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. All right, let's uh, get right into it here. I just want to talk to you. We've had a couple incidents, right? A couple of shootings, um, a lot at bars, kind of places that uh, people in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City go at night and not necessarily in one neighborhood, right? We had the Pink Parrot in Bricktown, this most recent one at that hookah lounge there, the Whiskey Barrel Saloon. Um, so I want to ask you, I mean, do you feel like going out at night here in Oklahoma City is dangerous right now? I, I don't. I mean, if you look at, you know, statistically speaking, um, especially in entertainment areas and other things, we have a larger law enforcement presence. It tends to be safer. But the problem is when you mix firearms with alcohol, uh, some of those were uh, gang involved. And so you mix those three things together and uh, it's just it's just a bad combination. Um, everybody out nowadays, you know, pretty much we run across a lot of people that are carrying firearms. Matter of fact, I would say the majority of our uh, um, stops and interactions that we have uh, with the public include folks that are carrying firearms, some legally, some uh, illegally. So with the increase in people carrying firearms, does that change y'all's late night plan at all? What is the current late night plan for, for the Oklahoma City Police Department? So it just changes the dynamic um, because again, you know, it's, it's not so much that people are carrying firearms, but it's carrying firearms and getting intoxicated, and which is illegal. You're not supposed to be carrying guns in bars anyway and drinking alcohol. Um, but you know, folks that are already doing or illegally carrying aren't going to obey the law anyway. Um, so, but we always have uh, extra folks out on the weekends, especially in the Bricktown area. Our violent crime team uh, goes out regularly on the weekends, and and they try to specifically be in areas where we get intelligence that we're more likely to have issues occur. So that's one of the things that we've been doing a lot more um, in the past three years is trying to target those areas and predict those areas where we're more likely to have a problem. Um, are you guys still looking for, for more officers out there? I know that was a thing we've talked about kind of over and over and over again. How's hiring going? Because does that play a factor in it at all in terms of like getting more boots on the ground to different areas? Oh, absolutely. The more officers you have, the more, um, you know, the more visibility and the more you can be out in the public. Uh, we've tried to counter what we're um, not getting in police officers with uh, non-sworn staff and technology in ways that we can try to get officers not responding to so many low-level calls. And I'll tell you one of the biggest things that I see right now, um, and we see it too, I've had a couple of complaints recently about people trying to call 911 and getting placed on hold. But the problem is, um, and not in those particular instances, but the problem is people calling the police for things they shouldn't be calling them for. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, it backs up our 911 system. It causes our officers to not be responding to things that they should. And so um, that's something that we're gonna be working on more over the next several months is getting the information out to the public of those things that you shouldn't be calling the police for. Now, when, when we, you know, when we hear about these shootings uh, here at the station, I know, and I'm sure a lot of members of the public agree, you know, your breath kind of hitches and you, you, you get scared in this day and age that it could be like the one, the, the mm -hmm. mass shooting event that we're seeing all across the country. So how have the Oklahoma City Police Department's training and conversations around mass shootings really shifted over the past couple of months and years, really, as we see more and more of these things? Because it's so sad to say, but it almost feels like it could happen here at any time at this point, you know? Yeah, and you have to have that mentality. I mean, it's sad to say that, but our mentality at the police department is not if we have one, it's when, mm -hmm. so that we're prepared. Um, and we prepare ourselves, we, we do a lot of intelligence gathering and try and pick up on those things. Um, any uh, school threat or any type of threat of violence um, where, where someone is threatening, you know, like mass type violence or, or high density populated locations, we, we have investigators that respond to that, officers go out on that. We respond to every one of those and check those out. Uh, we just recently had all of our police officers go through um, the, uh, um, the active shooter training that was mandated by the governor last year. And so now all of our officers have been through that. The great thing about that is all police officers in the state are going through the same training. So if we have, um, like Oklahoma City does, it, it has a lot of other municipal, uh, municipalities that we surround. And so you're very likely to have Bethany officers and Oklahoma City officers show up to the same uh, mass shooting event or Edmond or you know pick a city that we that we are in or, or the highway patrol as well. And so now we've all been trained the same way. So no matter who gets there first, we can all go in and work together. So kind of that streamlined approach has helped, you think, in terms of, of, of getting everyone there? Absolutely, not only getting there, but, but how you respond once you're in there. Okay. 
um, so that you know we're we're trained to you know when we come in if we don't know where the shooter is we're going to start a process to quickly move through and search and, and try to find that individual and then if you hear gunfire you go towards the gunfire and so um, and you saw that in uh, uh, the, the shooting in Nashville at the school. That's yeah. exactly what those officers did. They went in, they were starting to clear certain areas and then they heard gunfire and went toward the gunfire and were able to get the shooter. So our goal is to get there as quickly as we can, hopefully prevent uh, any loss of life, but at least minimize that and get that shooter you know, taken down as quickly as possible. Um, switching gears here, I wanna ask you about um, about Sergeant Morgan Reynolds. She was the female officer who was just viciously beaten and attacked by, by a suspect. And we actually saw that body cam video, really hard to watch. How's she doing? I, I was very fortunate um, last Thursday, I was able to break away and go out and visit with her. And it was wonderful to see her because, um, and I'll be honest, I was amazed at how good she looked. She is really healing up uh, well. Her attitude was tremendous. Um, she, you know, the biggest thing she wanted to talk about is getting back to work. Mm. Uh, so it, it was very uh, um, uplifting to say the least for me to be around her and see that. I mean, it, it really frustrates me that this happens. We're seeing it more and more. Uh, that individual that attacked her should have been in prison, should have never gotten out. Um, and we see that a lot now. And uh, I, I don't know how this is happening, but it seems to be happening more and more. E everybody, when they talk about criminal justice reform, they talk about, you know, well, we'll keep the violent people and make sure you know that those violent criminals are staying behind bars, but it's not happening. I mean, more and more you're seeing them out on the street. Uh, I've actually got a meeting with uh, our training staff this week because in the last um, uh, several months, we've seen more of our officers injured than I can remember in a long time. So we're gonna look at what we're doing and make sure there's not something that we're missing. Uh, but I think too, the criminal justice system has gotta help us out. They've got to start putting these people that are violent and willing to attack police officers. They've gotta start putting them behind bars and keeping them there. And then looking back, I'm sure when you guys watch that body cam video, as you said, maybe the department would make some changes, seeing what, what could have been done better in that situation as well from your end? Absolutely, and, and it's hard when you look at it. Um, I've looked at it several times, and I, I really don't see what she did wrong. She, she had backup that was coming, um, but she's got people you know, screaming and yelling inside there. She can't just sit there and allow an assault to happen or, or you know something else, so she had to go in. Uh, but again, just because you know, we, we may not see something right there uh, and then we possibly have something in our training that we can look at. So we're always going to do that and we debrief and analyze um, every event that happens because I don't want another officer to go through that. We are so thankful she is okay. That was a really nice update. We've been thinking about her here. So thanks for sharing that with us, Chief. We really appreciate it. And I can tell you she appreciates it too. She's talked about the community support and the support of our department. And uh, like I said, she's, she's just ready to get back to work. A true hero there, ready Absolutely. to get back. All right, yeah. Chief, thanks so much for your time today. As always, great to see you. You bet. Thanks for having we me. We appreciate it. Jonathan, over to you.